Hello everyone! I didn't have intention to produce this video since I'm working now on the second part of the video about religion in the Soviet Union, but in the light of recent event with Salman Rushdie, I decided to record this short book review on the work of Harvard professor of Islamic studies Shahab Ahmed. I've read it a couple years ago and found it interesting. The book was published by Harvard University Press in 2017. Its main argument is that for the first two centuries of Islam, the Satanic Verses incident was nearly universally accepted by the early Muslims as an authentic, and only later Islamic theologians rejected it as a heresy. Ahmed states that reports of the Satanic Verses incident were recorded by virtually every compiler of the major biography of Muhammad in the first two centuries of Islam, and then he gives those examples. Moreover, all the 1st and early 2nd century reports are agreed that the Prophet uttered the Satanic Verses. But what do we mean under the Satanic Verses in the Quran? This is how Jonathan A. C. Brown explains it in his Muhammad A Very Short Introduction, published by Oxford University Press. The Satanic Verses refer to an incident in the life of the Prophet in which he supposedly announced verses of the Quran which affirmed polytheistic beliefs and then retracted them. In the year 615, during the darkest time of Quraysh uh, oppression of the Muslims, God revealed the Quranic verse. Have you considered Alad, al uzza and Al-Manad, the third, the other, supposedly followed by the verse these are the high-flying cranes, whose intercession is to be sought. According to this story, soon afterwards, Gabriel informed Muhammad that this last verse had not been revealed by God. Rather, Satan had fooled the Prophet into thinking it was divine revelation. The verse was removed from the Quran and replaced by the verse that follows verse 5320 in the Quran we know today. Jonathan Brown also states that later God comforted Muhammad by revealing the next surah in the Quran. We never send a messenger or prophet before you without Satan intervening in his desires, but God abrogates what Satan interposes. Brown also recognizes that the story of the Satanic Verses appears in the Sirah of Ibn Ishaq, as well as most early works of Quranic commentary. See also Ibn Taymiyyah, a famous Muslim theologian of the early 14th century. Basically this means that supposedly, in order to please the Qurayshi tribe, who ruled ancient Mecca and were the guardians of the Kaaba, uh, but who did not trust Muhammad, he allegedly recognized the three goddesses Aluza, Alad and Manad uh, as those whom you can worship, because they are the daughters of Allah, and they will convey the message to him like cranes. Many Orientalists suggest that in the early stages of the establishment of Islam, the Prophet Muhammad was forced to make peace with the Qurayshi by including Allah uh, in his pantheon as his wife or daughter of Allah. But later, with the establishment of Islam, her idol was destroyed. According to the Soviet scholar of Islam Lundin, among the Arabs of Central Arabia, the goddess al uzza together with the goddess Allah and Manat, was part of the triad of goddesses daughters of Allah, and in the south of Central Arabia, al uzza acted as the wife of Allah and the mother of Allah and Manat. Robert Wright in his Evolution of God also shares a similar narrative. But let's get back to Shahab Ahmed, who, after careful investigation, cites no less than 50 historical accounts handed down by the first generations of Muslims, which clearly demonstrate that this incident constituted an absolutely standard element in the memory of the early Muslims about the life of their Prophet. Ahmed shows that at least some early Muslims up to the 9th century consider the satanic verses to be an established fact in the history of the Prophet. It was confirmed even by the closest associates of Muhammad and his biographers. But in the period from 800 to 1100, denials appear in the literature. And during this period, the number of teachers who accepted and rejected the incident was about the same. Uh, but already in the period from 1100 to 1800, the denial of the incident becomes the dominant position. 
and those who reject the incident regularly accuse those who accept it of disbelief. Yet the controversy is still ongoing. However, in the 19th century, those who continued to accept this story were finally considered heretics. This way, Ahmed shows the trajectory or the evolution of a specific theological idea in the specific religious tradition. Ahmed notes that today, all these and other movements and branches of Islam do not recognize the fact of the satanic verses of the Quran, because this calls into question the integrity of the process of God's communication with Muhammad, and therefore the integrity of the text of the Quran. But again, as Ahmed claims, at least up until the 19th century some Muslims saw no contradiction in this. To them, it was acceptable to believe that such thing could happen to their prophet, because at the end God protected his message anyway. It's just that over time the epistemological vision of what Muhammad's prophetic activity meant theologically have changed. After all, it is not a secret that Muhammad from the very beginning doubted the divine revelation. He thought he was being tormented by an evil spirit. He was horrified at the thought of the source of his revelation, but then his wife Khadija reassured him, saying that this was a message from Allah. In the Surah 81.25, it is specifically emphasized that these are the words of the Quran and not the speech of Satan. But why there is a need for such excuses? Similar things are seen in Surahs 59.16 or 22.52. In his other book, What is Islam?, published by Princeton, Shahab Ahmed talks about many other things that today are considered taboo in Islam, but before were quite normal practice among Muslims. For example, drinking wine or using various art images, which are now banned. Ahmed refers to many documents and even images to prove his point. He explores history, art, philosophy, music, poetry and other means that have made Muslims what they are, and points out how Islam created Muslims and how Muslims created Islam. He points out paradoxes and contradictions in an attempt to understand what it means or what it meant to be a Muslim in the past. It shows that Islam can be different, and the understanding of what it means to be a Muslim have changed over time and the scope of what is considered orthodox and what is heresy can categorically change over time as well. Therefore, it may come with no surprise for scholars of religion that certain doctrines or traditions were viewed differently in the past. And even today Islam is so different. As Saba Mahmud states, Islam for me is not a single cultural formation, but following Talal Asad, a discursive tradition whose practitioners struggle over what it means to live as a Muslim in this world.